And thanks every, everybody for coming. And I'm assuming that uh, m most of you are familiar with my work. So uh, right off the bat, it probably seems somewhat unlikely that I would do a book-length biographical comic about Margaret Sanger. Probably it sounds like a bit square, a bit stuffy subject matter, but uh, I assure you that it isn't. At least I didn't think so, um, as I read about her and learned about her. Um, but it, doing, not, doing nonfiction work and uh, doing biographical work is not brand new to me. I've been sneaking up to doing something th th like this, leading up to it. Um, the biggest hurdle of doing something like this, and particularly a subject like Margaret Sanger, is the research involved. For one thing, there's an awful lot written about her, um, awful lot written by her. She was incredibly prolific. So uh, I just was swamped with just mountains and mountains of material to sift through. So it was very uh, labor intensive to do this, way beyond just simply drawing it. You know, I spent like a solid year working on it. Um, and that to a large degree, in fact, it's the main reason why I'm doing this book with Drawn and Quarterly. I usually work with Fantagraphics and sometimes Dark Horse. I've, I've always admired Drawn and Quarterly, but I've never done anything with them before. But uh, I, although I've known the publisher, Chris Oliveros, for a long time, and um, he's somebody that, I, at least I knew that he was willing to give me a, a, a decent sized advance, which for something like this was absolutely necessary. You know, I had, it was gonna be a long time before the book was in print and I couldn't have afforded the time otherwise. So I just wanted to give a, a, a really big thank you to Chris Oliveros of Joining Quarterly for literally making it possible for me to do this. Now, how I wound up read, writing about Sanger, the road that led me to her was, um, I do an awful lot of work for Reason Magazine, and Reason has a very libertarian political slant to it. Um, and what I learned recently was that uh, the modern American libertarian thought was pretty much defined by three women, um, the most famous of which is Anne Rand, but even to, to a greater degree for me, two other, uh, they were both authors from the early part of the 20th century. One woman's name was Isabel Patterson, and I did a short bio biographical story about her. She was a successful novelist, but she also was a critic for um, the New York Herald, I believe it was, a literary critic for 25 years. And, uh, and another author is Rose Wilder Lane, who I'd also love eventually to do a, a graphic novel about. She was the daughter of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and in fact, was sort of her, her mother's ghostwriter on the Little House on the Prairie books. And, um, and the, but these women wrote, they also wrote books explaining their political philosophy, which I very much agreed with. So anyhow, I, was ver I became fascinated by these women. A third woman too, who wasn't specifically a political philosopher, um, was, uh, but she was a novelist and also, um, lived at the same time as these other women I'm speaking of is uh, Zora Neale Hurston, who I imagine a lot of you are familiar with. Um, she also very much shared these other women's political worldview, and their lives were all very similar, They, especially for their time. It was before the women's right movement of the 60s, their heyday, both in terms of activity and in and creativity, was the roughly between the two world wars. Uh, the 20s and 30s, and they lived incredibly free lives. And e even in their own biographical material, they rarely reflected on the fact that they were women. They just did whatever they wanted. They lived their lives like men, um, in a sense. And the only time that they would ever address the fact the, address the fact that they were female is when somebody would ask them about it. So, um, but one, but so I wondered how were they. Why were they so different in that regard from most women of that time? Um, I couldn't help but notice, though, as I read about them, that uh, they were not encumbered by children in pregnancies. <laughs> um, and I know, at least with one instance, uh, Rose Wilder Lane was unable to have children after, uh, after losing one in childbirth, and after that she couldn't get pregnant. But with the rest, I just assumed they practiced birth control. That got me very interested in 
birth control, what women it was particularly used in those days, and how available it was, all kinds of questions. That's how I wound up reading about Margaret Sanger. What I found incredibly fascinating about her when I began to do internet searches on her is how the very first things that you would read, like what very much dominates all discussion about Margaret Sanger on the internet is that she's a racist and a Nazi, just all the worst thought crimes that somebody could have in this day and age. But as I read her own material in its, own, in its original context and its original form, these are all lies. They're not true at all, even though almost everybody thinks that she's some kind of a monster. It's just absolutely not true. And so I'm about to, I'm gonna touch on, in the book I touch on, just an endless list of ironies regarding her and what people think of her. Um, for one thing, a lot of th this character assassination that's been going on with her is a deliberate attempt on the part of people who have uh, specifically have are pro-life. They're against abortion, and thus they're very critical of, to put it lightly, of Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood is an organization that more or less, Margaret Sanger started. You know, it, it wasn't quite that simple, but more than anybody else, she's probably responsible for starting Planned Parenthood. So they want to destroy the reputation of the person that started Planned Parenthood. So, and like, again, one of the many crimes that, and this is the funniest one, and one of the many crimes that she's accused of, it's like a meme that you see a lot on the internet, is that she's the quote, end quote, inventor of abortion, <laughs> which is hilarious because abortion's been around for as long as humans been around. The other strange thing too is that Margaret Sanger herself throughout her entire life was completely against abortion. She was utter morally opposed to it and also since she was a practicing nurse, she also, uh, and, and she worked as a nurse at a time when we, they didn't have antibiotics. She had like this very visceral fear of any kind of surgical procedure, which would include abortion, you know, whether it was self-inflicted or done by a midwife or a doctor, just she'd seen too many women who s suffered horribly from the infections that uh, would occur more often than not with these botched abortions. Um, anyhow, I, I've already talked so much before I've shown a single slide here, but uh, <laughs> um, here's the cover of the book. Um, this is a very iconic, if you're familiar with Margaret Sanger, there's a famous photograph, I don't know if it's gonna appear here, here it is, that this photograph is what inspired the cover of the book. Um, and like I said, it's a very iconic picture of her uh, with the gag. And the circumstances surrounding this was, um, throughout the 1920s, she was banned from speaking publicly in Boston. They had a very uh, a religious Catholic mayor who uh, I forget his name um, offhand, but um, he's the person that's responsible for the old saying, banned in Boston. And so she, she could visit Boston, of course, but she was unable to speak publicly there. So there was uh, this iconoclastic group of uh, radical types. This is in 1929. They very much wanted her to speak, and they came up with a rather clever way. Uh, the group, they were called like the Ford Forum, something like that, They'd have, they would have an annual um, you know, a wild event. So they invited her up, gagged her, and the gag was to illustrate the fact that she was legally prohibited from speaking in Boston. She sat on the stage, and again, that's uh, she sat on the stage in the middle with the gag on, but she wrote a speech, and the speech was read by the man on the left uh, is Arthur Schlesinger Sr., who is a historian. And then after he read the speech on her behalf, so in a sense, she was able to speak to the audience in a very roundabout way. And then the man on the right is the famous uh, defense attorney, Clarence Darrow, who then uh, wrote a, read a speech of his own. I don't know how legible <laughs> this is. I, I included in this slideshow um, uh, several pages of uh, the book. And here is a sample page from her youth. And what's occurring in this particular page. I won't read it all out, I won't act it out for you, but, because uh, that'd be boring. But um, basically what's going on here is a, a bit of background. Her, both of her parents are born in Ireland um, and, and emigrated to the U.S. at a very young age. Her mother was a very devout Catholic, 
Um, her father, her parents got along great, but they were v almost opposites in every way. Her father was an atheist, he was a socialist. Um, he liked to drink and talk, while the mother was very silent, very humble, you know, very diligent, a very hard worker. Um, they also, in the in 25 years, her mother died when she was about 50, but in the, the 25 years that they were married, she had 18 pregnancies, and um, 11, of them, 11 of the pregnancies resulted in a live birth, and 10 of the children lived to, um, lived to adulthood, which back then was a very good batting average for a poor working class family. Uh, they lived in Corning, New York, uh, which was a factory town, still is, it's where Corning Glassware is and was. Um, and literally everybody that worked in the factory, all the, the grunts in the town were all Irish Catholic. Um, and then on the other side of the tracks, the people you know, who owned the factory, you know, the doctors and the lawyers were almost all Protestant. Before that, because of that reason, there was no, when Margaret Sanger was growing up, there was no public school. So she, so because of their circumstances, she had no choice but to go to a Catholic school. And uh, the church leaders and the more religious people in the town really despised Margaret Sanger's father. The, the, her maiden name is Higgins. They, Michael Higgins is her father's name. And he used to invite to town politicians and speakers, like here the one that's being referenced is Robert Ingersoll, who in the 1800s was a very famous vocal atheist. And uh, so naturally he was despised by, um, by religious types. And so he, inv he invited Ingersoll to Corning to speak. It caused a complete riot. They were literally assaulted with cabbages and tomatoes. Um, and, uh, and so here, like this particular instance, Margaret's teacher was just giving her a lot of crap, basically, about her family, her father. And uh, w uh, one very big mistake to make is to mess with any of the Higgins. The Higgins family were incredible. Throughout their life, she was very, very close to her family, especially her three sisters. Um, so she absolutely refused. And this also is an example of her unbelievable stubbornness. She, um, she refused to go back to school. Uh, she just sat in a chair at her parents' house for an entire week, and absolutely they could not even physically drag her to school. Um, so finally, what happens in this page is her two older sisters, who are already had jobs of their own and were saving money, they paid for her to go to a private school where she very much thrived. Here's a, this, I love this picture. It's um, on the far right is her father. This was taken in the 20s. Um, so her father was quite old when this picture was taken. Um, so that's her, the father wearing the hat. But those are the four Higgins sisters. And uh, the oldest is Nan on the left. Nan never married, and neither did uh, the, the one next, and next to the father, Mary. The two of them never married, which actually was not that uncommon in those days for the two oldest sister or oldest sisters to never get married. Part of it was because they were sur surrogate mothers for their younger siblings, and that tends to cut into courting time. <laughs> Um, but Nan very quietly worked, she was one of many people who worked behind the scenes for Margaret throughout her life, you know, worked at her clinics and what have you. Her name hardly ever pops up in biographies, but she was always there for her. And, that, and that's Margaret Sanger, uh, second to the left. And then there's Ethel, who in the middle, the youngest sister, who also, she, who, if anything, she was even more radical and more politicized than uh, Margaret Sanger was. Um, this picture here, um, she, Margaret ha had no choice but to leave the private school she was attending, and as I said, she really enjoyed it, and she had intended to go to Cornell and become a nurse, become a doctor, I'm sorry. Um, but her mother suffered throughout her life from tuberculosis, and she was in a particularly bad way at a certain point, and was unable to take care of Margaret's younger siblings, so they dragged her home. She had to come back home to care for her mother and for her little brothers. Um, and it, like in this page too, she's just at, you know her mom said she just had another miscarriage, and she was just marveling over that, and like asked her, "Did you and Dad want eighteen kids?" And her mother's philosophy was just, you know, no, we didn't, but that was the Lord's will. And uh, so here, Margaret Sanger is very much like, "I'm never going to be that way. I'll never let 
life toss me around like a cork in the ocean, you know. In fact, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to change human history, <laughs> the course of civilization, which he more or less did. Uh, one thing that actually that came in very handy when you're doing um, an illustrated biography of someone is there were thousands of photographs that I was able to find of Margaret Sanger, even when she was very young and very poor, and this is like the late 1800s. These two pictures, she was in her teens when they were taken. Uh, there were just so many pictures, and she clearly loved to be photographed. She was, um, and I don't mean this as an insult, she was quite vain, very, very proud of her appearance. And again, even when she didn't have much money, she always dressed very stylishly, was very, very proud of her um, very long auburn hair. And used to throw her out her life, she would pin it in these elaborate Gibson girl buns that were like a nightmare to draw. <laughs> this page here, what's unique about it is this page pretty much covers, on this one page, 10 whole years of her life. This is quite remarkable. It was, it's from roughly 1902 when she married her husband, William Sanger, hence the name. Uh, from 1902 to roughly 1912. Um, they lived a very comfortable, suburban, middle-class existence. Um, he was an architectural draftsman by trade, made a good living. Um, he just built and designed their own house in Hastings-on-Hudson, if anybody knows where that is. Um, had three children and uh, just lived, you know, and she was a housewife for the most part. But she always pretty much chafed at it. it never, she always wanted more out of life. And also, not just her, but her husband too, they, even while they were living this middle class suburban lifestyle, um, they re always remained very much a part of progressive causes. He was just like Margaret's father, her husband was a very dedicated socialist. He was like the leader of the local chapter of the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party was quite big around this time, before World War I. World War I almost destroyed the Socialist Party, at least as a real threat. You know, they, uh, almost every state had uh, a handful of elected socialist politicians. Um, but uh, at one point, the house caught on fire, and uh, her husband did rebuild it, but to her, that was very much a, a sign. Margaret Sanger, throughout her whole life, had this very almost narcissistic belief that she was uniquely connected to the great beyond. And what fueled that notion was she did have incredibly accurate um, dreams and uh, visions that, unfortunately, they usually involved a tragedy, you know, like, like the death or illness of a loved one. But it was amazing how often they would come true. So she would always take signs and dreams very, very seriously, always took them as warnings. And she used the fire as a reason for them to go back in the city. Once they moved back to New York City, then um, they bo she resumed her nursing career, but she was determined just to uh, serve people in the Lower East Side, the poorest of the poor. Here, real quickly, is a photograph. Uh, there's hardly, any, uh, for all the photographs there are of Margaret Sanger, there's hardly any of her husband, William Sanger, and, but that was her first husband there on the left. Those are her three children, Stuart, Peggy, and uh, Grant. Um, and uh, I'm jumping around here, but um, something that very much traumatized all of them, and Margaret particularly, was at one point Peggy died of uh, pneumonia when she was about six years old in 1915, I believe it was. Um, so the picture on the far right is a very famous picture uh, that was widely d disseminated at the time of Margaret and her two surviving children. And that, that very haunting picture was it was arranged for and paid for by the communist journalist John Reed. Did anybody ever see that movie, Reds? Um, she, was, she was very friendly with John Reed and a lot of other radicals of the time. And he arranged for this picture, and the whole point of the picture was to generate a lot of sympathy and uh, also serve as publicity for her. Because this was at a time when she almost, she almost went to prison for her birth control activities. So this photo and the situation surrounding it, dealing with the death of her daughter, generated a lot of sympathy from people who otherwise wouldn't be sympathetic. It humanized her, in other words. This is what I have here, and again, I won't read all of it, but uh, word for word, but what I've illustrated here, it's a three-page scene, it's the only three-page scene in the book, um, is uh, 
it basically illustrates Margaret Sanger's, throughout her life, her number one go-to sob story to raise funds. And it was, her, it was called the Sadie Sachs story. And the circumstances around it was, she, once they moved back into the city, she resumed working as a nurse again. Um, what would happen is a, a, a doctor would get a call, or you know, someone would come to get a doctor to treat someone, a doctor would contact her. So she was like on call herself by doctors who would call her up. They'd have to go to the Lower East Side. Just going to the Lower East Side, and see, like Margaret Sanger herself grew up, you know, with, you know, with, under humble circumstances. Um, her father didn't have money more often than he did. But even still, the circumstances that she saw people living in in the Lower East Side at this time just horrified her. They were like beyond belief, the misery and poverty that people, they were almost all, well, they were all immigrants living down there and just packed like sardines in the filthiest, most disgusting tenements. People just literally threw their garbage out the windows. So in the summer, the courtyards of the tenements were just festering. She was quite horrified by this, and seeing all of this radicalized her even further. You know, she, like I said, she was raised by a socialist, married a socialist, but she became extremely active in especially labor causes. And birth, there was no birth control movement at the time. She almost, start, I, she didn't entirely, but she almost started it single-handedly. Because unlike most people, she very much saw how uncontrolled and, uh, and births by these poor women who couldn't have feed themselves was just making it, this situation harder and harder for them. She, uh, so anyhow, the Sadie Sachs story is about, um, that she would always tell everybody, it was about a woman that, whose home they were called to, uh, and she had just uh, aborted her fetus. And she was hemorrhaging, and, uh, and it, looked, it looked like she was coming down with an infection. And after like a week of constantly visiting her and working with her, they were able to cure her. But once she was cured, she just kept asking Margaret Sanger, uh, could you, she goes, I know that there are ways to avoid pregnancy. It's like, I know that I, it's not a coincidence that wealthy women, again, wealthy and politically connected people did have access to birth control and they could get legal abortions. Not, not legal abortions, but they could get abortions without getting in trouble for it. Um, it just was, it was literally against the law to share any, any kind of sex information at this time. They couldn't even verbally tell her what to do without at the very least risk losing their license to practice. And they could even literally be sent to jail for telling this woman how to not get pregnant. Um, so, uh, and, and also there's like, there was just this general attitude that that's a woman's lot in life is to get pregnant and that's what happens. And if you don't want to get pregnant and don't have sex, which is a very, it, Margaret Sanger all of her life fought that notion. I mean, it's like an argument that still is being made. She was one of the very few, one of the first and very few who says that that attitude totally denies human behavior. Pe you, you can't tell people to not have sex. But it was something that everybody was very uncomfortable to talk about, to talk about natural human desire. And, uh, um, well, anyhow, uh, this one was pleading for information. Like she said, she, she was, I even know that uh, prostitutes know how to avoid getting pregnant. You know, it was part of their trade. She goes, why do they know these things and I'm not allowed to know it? So Margaret, when the doctor came, Margaret asked, uh, Oh, sorry, that went ahead too far. Margaret asked, she was afraid to, but she asked the doctor to tell the woman, you know, the, well, basically the, the story with this woman too is she almost died with her last baby at the, her last birth. That's why she aborted herself. And now she's terrified of getting pregnant again. And the doctor's telling her, yeah, you should be afraid of getting pregnant again, especially after what you did to yourself. I think it'd be a disaster. You know, all the damage you did to yourself down there with your self-induced abortion. So she says, well, can you tell me how to prevent it? And the doctor literally said, oh, so you want to have your cake and eat it too? Nothing doing. And Margaret was like, don't you have any advice for her? And his famous advice was, he told her, tell your husband to sleep on the roof. And then he left. Um, you know, and then uh, what I didn't draw was the ending of the story. I thought it was a bit too over the top and a bit too maudlin. But the ending of her story, here what I, I just showed Margaret, like the woman just told Margaret, go get lost. You're no use to me. And so I show Sanger leaving and just kicks a can out of frustration. Um, the ending of the story that she would tell is that the same woman did get pregnant again, did abort her, her 
fetus again, and but this time died as a result. But again, like I didn't want to draw that just because it seemed a little bit, I mean, not that I find it implausible. Women died horrific deaths from self-induced abortions every day, but uh, I don't know. It just seemed like a bit much to draw it. <laughs> so it, largely in response to all of this, sh uh, there was a socialist newspaper called the New York Call, and she started a weekly column there. And it was actually a very tame, gently written sex advice column. It was basically just cover the birds and bees and, uh, and, and advice how to, how to tell your children about the facts of life, you know, you know advice about sex w uh, you know, as you raise your children, things like that. The column was called What Every Girl Should Know. But, and of course what I'm describing to you sounds incredibly tame, but it also was completely illegal. The country was still, for a very long time, the country was, uh, we had something called the Comstock Laws, um, which was written by and enforced by somebody named Anthony Comstock, who was originally a, uh, like a moral crusader. And he actually came up with his own, wrote this legislation and approached Congress when they all had their foot on a door, they're about to take off for summer recess, convinced them to uh, pass it as he had written it, passed it into law, hence the name, the Comstock Laws. And it, th and, uh, it banned the use of any material that had anything to do with sex from being sent through the mail with very st stiff penalties. Uh, and that included, I mean, not just pornography, but any, any romantic literature that got the least bit descriptive. Um, it included any advice regarding contraceptives or STDs, and it even banned uh, anatomy textbooks. So. Uh, and he used to brag about it. Anthony Comstock was, to make matters worse, the country, of the government appointed him uh, the postmaster, the chief inspector of the US Post Office, and they even gave him a sidearm that he wore at all times. The biggest buffoon, biggest jerk that ever lived in American history. <laughs> it, was, it was so hard to write about him and talk about him without it seeming implausible, you know? It's like, everybody, all humans are somewhat nuanced, not this guy. And it was a piece of work. And uh, so, if, and they knew that this would eventually attract his attention. It did. He sent them a cease and desist letter. Margaret wanted to keep doing the column. Her edit editor was like, no, no, we're all get the paper will get shut down. We'll, we'll get arrested. People will be out of work. So Margaret, right there on the spot on a piece of paper, she drew this out. She goes, well, here's my next column. Just write this. What every girl should know, nothing. And she wrote it, just like, and they, by order of the post office department. And her editor thought this was brilliant. They published it like this, and that this one attracted, like already her column, w the, this very gentle sex advice column I was describing to you, it was controversial even amongst their fellow radicals. A lot of, it, it was a socialist newspaper. They lost about a fourth of their subscribers because of this column. Um, but this really created quite a firestorm. It got everybody talking about it when they saw this in the paper and it made her a bit of a cause celeb. It also, it had Anthony Comstock's sights set right on Margaret Sanger. She became his worst nightmare. They started, it was like an all out war and she relished it. She loved every minute of it. She couldn't wait to go to war with him. You know, and she was like, and I'm going to win. And she did. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, I was gonna say. Ah, I should move on anyway. I, I find myself getting stuck on each one of these too long. Anyhow, around this time too, because she became a minor celebrity over her that column I just showed you, people began asking her to take part in all kinds of causes. And uh, again, because of her socialist leaning, she became very involved with with the labor movement, but specifically the International Workers of the World, also called IWW, but almost everybody referred to them as the Wobblies. And she, she very much admired uh, one, uh, one labor leader in particular, a guy named uh, Bill Haywood. And uh, she, was, uh, she was very stubborn, didn't take orders from anybody, but she, the one exception was Bill Haywood. She would do whatever he asked of her. So they, whenever there was a strike happening in some poor mill town, she would take part in it one way or the other, sometimes working as a nurse. In this one, she was simply picketing a place that had a lot of, she was very much against child labor, which was quite common back then. Uh, at this particular story, I just had to illustrate this one because because it was so funny. Even though she was a pacifist, and there's no incident I could find of her committing or even threatening to commit violence against anybody, 
Uh, she was charged with this attempted assault on this politician here in town. She says, and I, for that reason I, I just described, I believe her, she claims that she was just trying to keep him from grabbing her sign. But because of that, she and some of her co cohorts were sent to the local town jail. They had to, sh three women for five days shared a small cell with one cot, and it was filthy. There, it was just rats and bugs everywhere. And also, the jailhouse, they would only flush the toilets once a day. So the toilets were just overflowing with piss and crap. And they were pleading with them to flush the toilets, as well as call a lawyer. Uh, the cops and the mayor, the mayor used to hang out and play cards there, and they thought it was hilarious, the misery they were subjecting these women to. And they say, nope, nope, those are the rules, flushing it just once a day. So f she got fed up, so Sanger took her food cup, her drinking cup, and just started scooping out the shit, and the rest followed suit, and they just kept pouring it out. And there were other women in other cells. They all just kept tossing out the, 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 the contents of the toilet and made a river of shit and piss that <laughs> flowed past the guards' office until they couldn't stand the smell. So they were like, all right, we'll flush, we'll flush. <laughs> and she got them to call a lawyer. Um, at a certain point, her... her radical beliefs and just radical nature had just completely consumed her. So she started, by herself, she started this publication in 1914 called The Woman Rebel. This is the first issue. It was like a zine. It was like a riot girl zine. <laughs> but it makes every riot girl scene incredibly tame. This was, this was incredibly inflammatory. Even her many radical friends thought that she was just really going over the top. She was viciously attacking not only just the status quo and the establishment and Comstock and the Rockefellers, but she also routinely attacked her fellow radicals. And in fact, right here on this first page where it says the new feminists down there, that was attacking self-described feminists because she went to um, the first ever feminist meeting and, but most of the p prac women who self-described feminists who took part in this meeting were of upper and middle class background. And so they held panels on subjects like the right to ignore fashion and the right to keep your maiden name. And, it, and so she just thought it was ridiculous because here she is working with women in the slums. And she goes, this is really, this is what you think the biggest problem is that most women face <laughs> compared to what I see on a daily basis as a nurse. But of, well, of course, all that did was make her enemies amongst what should be her allies. She hadn't yet developed, she eventually became very politically savvy. With this, she wasn't savvy at all. And, uh, and this was so intense and inflammatory that even, her, even though her entire family, the Higgins, even though they all shared her political beliefs, they interpreted this publication as a cry for help and they considered having her committed. They really thought she was losing her mind. Uh, very much referencing what I was just talking about, you know, uh, shortly af after she started the Women Rebels, she also very much wanted to start the country's first uh, birth control organization to promote legalizing. All, basically, all she wanted was it to be legal to inform people about way different ways and means to practice birth control, which was against the law. She wanted to form a national committee. Uh, so she went to, uh, there was a very interesting club at the time in New York City called the Heterodoxy Club. It was an all-women club, and it was women of all different political beliefs. Um, you know, basically anybody who just considered themselves somewhat outside the norm to get together and just talk about uh, and share ideas. Um, and amongst the nominal leaders I drew here was of the women at the table. To the left is uh, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, uh, the author. She was like one of the uh, leading women in this group. And next to her with uh, wearing the turban is Mabel Dodge, who is a very wealthy heiress and uh, uh, very much involved with uh, radical causes. She would fund, you know, a lot of people considered her, you know, a poser and a dilettante, but she fed everybody <laughs> and paid for their, their stuff, so they tolerated her. She also was, like, romantically involved at the time with John Reed. Um, and then th the next woman is Mary Ware Dennett. And Dennett was like another Margaret Sanger. Um, pretty much did almost, she dedicated her life just as passionately as Margaret Sanger did to the cause of birth control. She's not nearly as well known, but uh, simply because she wasn't as media savvy as Margaret Sanger was, lacked her charm. Um, and uh, and a, a a very admirable woman for the same reasons that, assuming that you support the idea of birth control being legal, um, she did as much for the cause as Margaret did 
in many ways, but um, a big problem with hers, uh, and this was a very common problem throughout Margaret Sanger's life, is they couldn't stand each other. M Margaret in particular had a really, she could not stand even being in the same room as another alpha female, with very few exceptions. Uh, she just always butted heads. She had to be the leader. She had to be the boss. And so did Mary Ware Dennett. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dennett always aired her differences with Sanger publicly. Did this for years and years, for decades. She used to, whatever, like Margaret Sanger, when she was working on legislation in with congressmen in D.C. decades later, she would write letters to editors criticizing Sanger and uh, disparaging her. It was just ridiculous. It's like she... Unfortunately, ref she wouldn't keep their differences private, which, again, it was very regrettable, and it just made Sanger just hate her guts eventually. Um, so wh what happens here is Margaret's pitching the idea of, uh, of starting a national organization, but, and they all agree it's a great idea, but they don't want, because of the woman rebel, they don't want Margaret Sanger in charge of it. They just, they told her, you're too much of a bomb thrower, you know, and, and Mabel Dodge is already furious at her for making fun of the feminist meeting that they just had and making fun of the right, and, and Dennett is correctly telling her, you can't antagonize upper and middle class women. You know, you've got to stop this class warfare that you're practicing because we need them. You know, we've got to get them on our side or we'll get nowhere, which was true. Um, but uh, what was funny about this, though, is even though Dennett is pretty much saying, great idea, I'm going to steal it, I'm going to be the boss, you get out of here, but the very last thing she said was, can I have your mailing list? <laughs> Which Margaret gave her <laughs> for the cause. It, it, here is like another gathering of a uh, uh, powerful movement in Margaret's life. She eventually um, was arrested for, uh, for her, the women rebel. And because m much of the women rebel talked about birth control and sex issues, and she knew that it was just a matter of time before Comstock and the post office came after her, and they did. But Comstock did a very clever thing. When he charged her with mailing illegal material, he didn't charge her for anything that had to do with birth control. What Margaret did was, in the Women Rebel, she would, pu if anybody had some inflammatory article that nobody else would touch, she would publish it. You know, so it was kind of like a First Amendment thing that she had going on. She published an article that a friend, she didn't even agree with it. She published a friend, an article a friend wrote advocating political assassination. <laughs> Comstock charged her for that article, for publishing that article. She was totally willing to go to jail or face trial if, and, and her intention was to use the courtroom as a platform and, and, to, and to publicize her trial, which she, she, she went on trial many times in her life and she always played it up to the hilt and always milked it to her advantage. Um, but here she was going to be charged with something that she didn't even agree with. Um, and most likely was going to go to jail. And so she's like, I'm going to go to jail for something I don't even believe in, and I, I, I'm not going to get my day in the sun. So what she did was uh, she became a fugitive. She left the country, left her family, left everything, and went to England. In England, uh, they all knew of her. They'd all seen the Women Rebel, this particular group I've drawn here. And in England, uh, the cause of birth control was already much farther advanced than it was in the United States. So in this picture here at the top, she's at a meeting of um, the, the people, again, the people who I pictured here all belong to an organization called the Neo-Malthusian Society. And it's named after someone named Malthus. Uh, he was one of the very first people that began to notice the causes and the potential damage of overpopulation in the late 1700s. Um, and people who agreed with him and followed his advice or suggestions on how to solve the problem of overpopulation, they called themselves Malthusians. Unfortunately, like a lot of his, uh, a lot of his solutions were unworkable, like banning marriage till 25, like nobody's gonna get pregnant until they're 25. That was a dumb idea. Um, and, and also one of his tools for to reduce population, it was to encourage famine and war. <laughs> of course, directed at uh, undesirable populations. Those ideas were really hard sells. <laughs> so people who were particularly interested in limiting population via birth control, they got rid of the, those unsavory ideas I just described and called themselves the Neo-Malthusians. 
the same exact people also were in an organization called the Fabians. And the Fabians were basically socialists. They tended to be well-educated, usually upper-class people. They were socialists, but they advocated change through persuasion and through the ballot box and not through violent revolution. They were, pa they were pacifists also. So uh, again, in this top picture left, all of the people here played a very important part in Sanger's life, or most of them did through the rest of her life. Uh, the woman on the far left is Marie Stopes, and she was literally the, became the Margaret Sanger of England. Um, at that time, she was just, she, uh, she had the oddest profession. She was a paleobotanist. She was an expert on plants and vegetation from the dinosaur <laughs> days. Um, and she had, but she had written a book that she couldn't get published for obvious reasons. It was a, it was a, a sex advice book for young marrieds, for newlyweds. And what inspired it was her own horrible, miserable, short-lived marriage. It was almost like all wish fulfillment on her part. Um, she couldn't get it published. She tracked down Sanger, hoping that Sanger could get it published, but she couldn't get it either. Eventually, she, mar she, she had a doctor who married her, and with his own money, he published it. it was, the book was called Married Love, and it became a huge bestseller. It was like the first international bestseller, basically sex advice, although it was like supposed to be just for married couples. You know, it was banned a lot, awful lot. It was banned in America for a long time, but it became a very big bestseller. She then went on and pretty much mimicked everything that Sanger was doing in the state. She started birth control clinics, started a newsletter for about birth control. The next two people are the Drysdales. They were the leaders of the Neo-Malthusians, um, both doctors, and there's Margaret in the middle. Then there's George Bernard Shaw, the famous playwright, and he also, uh, he was very, again, something I haven't even mentioned yet that really complicates the story of Margaret Sanger is to a certain degree and at a certain point in her life, she, um, she advocated ideas and thoughts that fell under the umbre umbrella of this uh, school of thought called uh, eugenics. And right now, you just, especially since World War II, but it's increasingly ever since then, Eugenics is being more and more narrowly defined as being almost synonymous with Nazism and fascism and, and the deliberate, advocating the deliberate killing of undesirables, uh, whether, whether for ethnic reasons or because of physical or mental defects. Um, of course, back at, the, at this time, eugenics meant a lot more than that. The term literally means good genes and the, the idea behind it, and, the re and it used to be much more in far more encompassing was it simply was discussing ways, and almost everybody in academia believed in eugenics in some form or another back in the 1910s and 20s. It was basically any means to improve future generations, mentally and physically. It meant, it, it included dental hygiene, you know, and uh, nutrition, and birth control. Birth control was a big part of it too, since not everybody, again, everybody that considered themselves a eugenist they they fought like crazy. They didn't all agree. And Margaret Sanger, at a certain point, she very much, she would I publicly identify herself as an advocate for the mo movement. But then also in her own writing, she was very critical of the very things that everybody was critical about. She was critical of it at the time. She never, ever, ever advocated um, uh, trying to eliminate less desirable populations. Um, she, uh, I couldn't find a single instance of her ever making a derogatory generalization about any ethnic group or racial group ever, and um, it, which made her incredibly rare for that time. It's so strange that now she has this reputation as a racist. She was the least racist person in the 1920s. Um, this, it, it's so, again, like she's got, she's synonymous with this, all of these notions now. But um, at the time, people who were were you believed in eugenics at the time and also advocated it along for racial reasons was President Theodore Roosevelt, um, who publicly worried, gave speeches about the polluting of the American gene pool and was in demanding that people of Anglo-Saxon stock have more babies. Woodrow Wilson was a raging racist and he also believed in all of this stuff too. Nobody ever speaks of these former US presidents as believing in the worst aspects of eugenics. The most controversial thing that Sanger ever touched on or talked about, and always because peop the people would ask her about it, so she was obliged to address it, is again, what was becoming very common is this notion of forced sterilization. 
She, of course, very much believed in voluntary sterilization, and she believed in paying poor women to have it. She met firsthand as a nurse a lot of poor women who would have loved to have been sterilized, had their tubes tied, but they couldn't afford it. You know, they couldn't afford the operation. Um, you know, and of course with men, it just meant, simply meant a vasectomy. But, um, so she of course believed in that, but when the subject of forced sterilization came about, she would say, she would say that she was in ex very extreme circumstances I could see it being done. If you have a woman, like, if you had a very poor woman, mentally unfit to take care of herself, let alone a child, then maybe, and, and, and also is so, isn't even mentally capable to, in a courtroom, speak for herself, but, and, and also comes from like a very poor, dysfunctional family. It's like someone like that, you know, it's, it's not quite a stretch, especially back in those days when life was so much harder and people were on average were so much poorer than we are now. It was very common for there to be the retarded woman who lives in town and keeps getting pregnant because she's so easy to take advantage of. But then every baby she has becomes a burden on everybody else. Um, you know, it's up to everybody else to f to care for and feed the childs of this woman who can't possibly take care of them herself. So she would say, in a situation like that, I could see it. That was her just definition of an extreme circumstance. But she always added the caveat that she was painfully aware of that as part of a slippery slope, you know, because the definition will start to get mission crude. And, after, and if we allow somebody, if we allow a judge, a politician to set that standard, to decide who to point at someone and say that person could be forcibly sterilized, then you've given that judge this power to expand it. And she worried about what these faceless bureaucrats and politicians, how they would define unfit. Like later in this book, she talked about, uh, she mentioned, used as a, for an example, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. She said the man was a genius, but he also had a lot of physical and mental problems, severe ones. She said, should he have been cold? You know, and she was like, do we have to sacrifice genius just to arrive at some very middle class sense of healthy conformity? Um, oh, the reason I got so sidetracked on that is those very uh, negative aspects of eugenics that she didn't agree with were, av were advocated by George Bernard Shaw. He did believe in very much in forced sterilization. He thought that all people who are mentally and physically defected should be forcibly sterilized. And when the Nazi regime began, he actually was said a lot of favorable things about them. He thought that this was great. Got it. Um, and in fact, he was well, a famous quote of his, well, I'm surprised it's not more famous, is after the Holocaust started, people asked him what he thought about that. And he says, it's terrible, it's terrible. But they said, well, we thought you were in favor of uh, eliminating undesirables. And he said, yeah, but not along ethnic grounds. That, you know, they're killing the wrong, he said they're killing the wrong people. <laughs> Again, I don't know why he doesn't have a reputation as a monster. And then uh, next to him is H.G. Uh, Wells, who she became, they eventually, she and H.G. Wells became, had a, a long off and on love affair. That's another thing too that I touch, touch on in the book is, uh, um, she had many lovers in her life. She was estranged from her husband by this time, but throughout her life she had a, many romantic relationships, all with, every single one of her lovers too was like a, um, without exception, was a highly intelligent and extremely accomplished on, you know, in some field or another. But uh, yeah, she had a, the letters between her and H.G. Uh, Wells were very funny. I'm being told that I have to call it quits, unfortunately. I knew I was going to do this. I barely scratched the surface. <laughs> it's just so much to say. <laughs> this book could have easily been a thousand pages long. But um, all right, um, I believe that right after this, I'm going to the Drawn and Quarterly booth to sign copies of the book. So if anybody's, if I piqued your interest, then I guess just follow me upstairs and I'll be signing the book. And uh, you should know too that this book is not officially out yet. It won't be in bookstores for like another three weeks at least. So this is a these are very advanced copies. So you'll be the first on your block <laughs> to own a copy of The Woman Rebel. <laughs> Thank you very much.